Hi, I'm Kat and today I have for you a true crime case award in Romanian and I will also be doing my makeup at the same time. So let's start with the word which is spintecător. 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 Well done guys, you just said Reaper. Today's video was suggested by Tom, one of my YouTube subscribers and viewers. And uh, because there is a lot of information out there around this case, I have decided to split the video in two parts. So today is part one and the second part will follow in the next two or three days. Peter, believing that he was on a mission from God to kill sex workers, killed 13 women and tried to kill at least seven others, all the while managing to escape police nine times. For five years, he terrified Britain as the Yorkshire Reaper. Peter William Sutcliffe was born on 2nd of June 1946 in Bingley, West Riding of Yorkshire. His parents were John William Sutcliffe and his Irish wife Kathleen Francis Coonan. Kathleen was Roman Catholic and John was a member of the choir at the local Anglican Church of St. Wilfred's. The children were raised in the Catholic faith and Peter was an altar boy for a short time. Peter was born a premature baby and he had to stay for two weeks in the hospital. Because his mother Kathleen was a victim of domestic abuse, it's possible that she suffered throughout her pregnancy, most likely at least from emotional stress. It's also possible that's why Peter was born premature. John, his father, was an alcoholic and he once smashed a beer glass over Peter's head because Peter was sitting in his chair at the Christmas table. This happened when Peter was only five years old. John really hated his wife and uh, to be honest, he wasn't much better for the rest of the family. Even though Peter was slightly built, his father would see him as a wimp, a mama's boy, always hanging from her apron. Peter's mother gave him a lot of attention and she would eventually be seen by him as perfect. From their history, it's clear that the whole family went through abuse from John, the father and the husband. He was a violent person, the kids would be whipped by John with a belt as punishment, and Peter's siblings later said that their father was a monster and the atmosphere in the house would change as soon as John would walk in. John's life was all about playing football, cricket, singing in the choir, drinking beer, and being a womanizer. When Peter was four years old, he was sent to St. Joseph's Catholic Primary School where he was really badly bullied. Other boys would be targeting him because of his size and because Peter had very skinny legs and he actually was very ashamed of this. As far as I understand, Kathleen, Peter's mother, had an affair, but I would assume which John, being a womanizer, he had his affairs as well. In 1970, John posed as his wife's lover in order to get her to a local hotel. At the same time, he took Peter and two of his siblings to witness their father exposing their mother's infidelities. When Kathleen arrived at the hotel, John pulled out a negligee from Kathleen's purse as the children were watching. Now, you can imagine what an impact this would have on Peter and his siblings. In particular, Peter, who saw his mother as perfect. And here you have John, the husband and father, showing the kids that Kathleen was being unfaithful. According to Dr. Nixon, a, psycho a psychiatrist, this incident is the most significant figure of what goes on to happen. In Peter's eyes, even the perfect women became distorted. They will let you down, they will lie, they will cheat, and they shouldn't be respected. Peter's father, John, would later say that he remembered Peter just standing there in shock 
with a look on his face like an animal. In his late teenage years, Peter was obsessed with voyeurism and he spent a lot of time spying on prostitutes and the men who were looking for their services. Peter became a loner and when he was 15 years old, he left school and took up some jobs, including as a grave digger at Bingley Cemetery in the 1960s. Because of his grave digger job, he developed a very dark sense of humor. His co-workers would say that Peter loved his job so much that he would even volunteer to do overtime in washing the corpses. Between November 1971 and April 1973, Peter worked at the Bayer Television Factory on a packaging line. He left his position when he was asked to go on the road as a salesman. After leaving Bayer Television, he worked night shifts at Britannia Works of Anderton International from April 1973. In February 1975, he took redundancy and used half of the, of the 400 pounds payoff to train as a heavy goods vehicle driver. 5th of March 1976, Peter was dismissed after stealing used tires. Until October 1976, he was jobless until he found a job as an HGV driver for TNWH Clark Holdings Limited on the Canal Road Industrial, Industrial Estate in Bradford. It seems that Peter, as a young man, paid prostitutes for services and it's been speculated that he had a bad experience being scammed out of money by a prostitute and her pimp. But there is no definitive evidence that he actually sought the services, like proper services, of prostitutes. However, he was just obsessed with them, including watching them selling their services in Leeds and Bradford. On 14th of February 1967, Peter met 16-year-old Sonia Zurma, the daughter of Czech refugees. They met at Royal Standard Pub on Manningham Lane in Bradford's Red Light District. They got married on 10th of August 1974. Sonia was studying to become a teacher when she was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. Her relationship with her husband was described as domineering. Sonia would slap him around and she would be quite aggressive to the point where Peter sometimes had to stop her by pinning her arms to her side during her unprovoked outbursts of rage. Barbara Jones, a journalist who had conversations with Sonia, described her as the most irritating, strangest and coldest person she'd ever met. Sonia had a few miscarriages and the couple were actually informed that she would never be able to have children. She eventually carried on with her teacher training course and during that time she had an affair with an ice cream van driver. And you know it's kind of like history repeating itself isn't it? Just like with Peter's mother. So Peter's mother is being unfaithful to his father then uh, Peter's wife is being unfaithful to him, so you can kind of imagine what, what goes through Peter's mind. When Sonia finished the course in 1977 and she started teaching, she and Peter used her salary to buy a house at 6 Garden Lane in Heaton, where they moved on 26th of September 1977. This is the same house they were living in at the time of Peter's arrest. Peter's first documented attack was in 1969. It was the attack of a female prostitute whom he met whilst he was looking for the other woman who tricked him out of money. He left his friend's minivan and walked up St. Paul's Road in Bradford until he was out of sight. When he returned to the van, he was out of breath as if he had been running. He told his friend, Trevor Bursall, to drive off quickly. Peter had followed the prostitute into a garage and hit her over the head with a stone in a sock. According to his statement later on, Peter said, I got out of the car, went across the road and hit her. The force of the impact tore the toe off the sock and whatever was in it came out. I went back to the car and got in it. 
The woman luckily wrote down the minivan's registration plate, so the next day Peter got a visit from the police. He admitted to hitting her, but he said he hit her with his hand. The police told him that he was really lucky that the woman didn't want to press charges. On the night of 5th of July 1975, Peter attacked again in Cayley. 36-year-old Anna Rogulskij was walking alone when Peter hit her unconscious with a hammer and slashed her stomach with a knife. He probably would have killed her, but he was disturbed by a neighbor, so he just left Anna there. Anna needed brain surgery and she survived, but she was psychologically traumatized by the attack. Afterwards, she was scared to go out because she felt that people were staring at her and pointing their fingers. Her life became a misery and she wished that she died in that attack. On the night of 15th of August 1975, Peter found another victim. 46-year-old Olive Smelt was attacked in Halifax. After having a brief, pleasant conversation about the weather, Peter attacked Olive from behind with a hammer. She suffered several blows to her skull. He then disarranged her clothing and slashed her lower back with a knife. He again was interrupted and uh, left Olive badly injured but alive. And just like Anna, Olive suffered severe emotional and mental trauma. Olive told Detective Superintendent Dick Holland that, uh, that the attacker had a Yorkshire accent, but this information was ignored, just the same as was the fact that neither Anna nor Olive were in towns with a red light area. On 27th of August 1975, Peter had another victim in mind. 14-year-old Tracy Brown was attacked in Silsden from behind and hit on the head five times while she was walking along a country lane. Thank God the car was passing by and when Peter saw the lights, he ran off. Tracy was alive, but she needed brain surgery. Peter wasn't convicted of this attack, but he confessed to it in 1992. Before being attacked, Tracy said that she was charmed by Peter at first. They walked together for almost one mile for around half an hour and she never felt in danger or intimidated. But the more sinister attacks were yet to come. 28-year-old Wilma Mary McCann was a mother of four children from Scott Hall. On 30th of October 1975 at 7.30 p.m. Wilma was last seen leaving her council house on Scott Hall Avenue in the Chapel Town area of Leeds walking past Prince Philip playing fields. Peter decided to attack her, so he struck the back of her skull twice with a hammer, then inflicted a stab wound to the throat, two stab wounds below the right breast, three stab wounds below the left breast, and a series of nine stab wounds around the umbilicus. Around the umbilicus. An investigation which involved 150 officers of the West Yorkshire Police and 11,000 interviews failed to find the person responsible. In December 2007, Wilma's eldest daughter died from suicide after years of depression over how her mother died and the consequences of her death to her and her siblings. In 1976, 42-year-old Emily Monica Jackson was persuaded by her husband into sex work because of their financial struggles. The family had a roofing business, so Emily used the business van to engage in prostitution. On 20th of January 1976, Emily was working outside the Gaiety pub on Round Hay Road when Peter approached her. He picked her up, then drove half a mile to some abandoned buildings on Anfield Terrace in the Manor Industrial Estate. Peter hit her on the head with a hammer, dragged her body into a yard filled with rubbish, then used a sharpened screwdriver to stab her in the neck, chest and abdomen. He also stamped on her thigh, leaving behind an impression of his boot. 
Peter stabbed Emily 52 times. 20-year-old Marcella Claxton was attacked by Peter in Roundhay Park on 9th of May, 1976. Marcella was walking home from a party when she accepted a lift from Peter. When she got out of the car to relieve herself, he hit her from behind with a hammer. Marcella was actually four months pregnant at the time of the attack. She survived, but because of this attack, she suffered a miscarriage and she required multiple extensive brain operations. As a result of the attack, she also had intermittent blackouts and chronic depression. Marcella testified against Peter later at his trial. On 5th of February 1977, Peter attacked 28-year-old Irene Richardson, a Chapel Town prostitute in Roundhay Park. Irene was last seen at 11.15 p.m. leaving a rooming house on Cowper Street, saying that she was going to Tiffany's, a pub and disco in the center of Leeds. Irene was bludgeoned to death with a hammer, stabbed three times in the stomach, and once she was dead, Peter mutilated her body with a knife. Tire tracks, which were left near the murder scene, resulted in a long list of possible suspect vehicles. Two months later, on 23rd of April, Peter killed 32-year-old Patricia Tina Atkinson Mitra, a prostitute, in her Bradford flat where police found a boot print on the bedclothes. According to Peter, he picked Patricia up in Manningham, Bradford, before driving to her place. He pulled down her jeans and her underwear and exposed her breast, then stabbed her six times in the stomach with a knife. I think this is finished. On 25th of June, 1977, 16-year-old Jane Michelle MacDonald went to meet friends at the Hof Hofbra House, a German-style beer club in Leeds. She had missed the last bus home and so she went back to her friend's house to wait for his sister to get her home. After around 45 minutes, she ended up walking home where she was attacked by Peter in Reginald Street in Leeds at around 2 a.m. Her body was discovered the next morning at 9.45 a.m. by children in the playground between Reginald Terrace and Reginald Street in Chapel Town. A post-mortem examination was carried out by the home pathologist, Professor David G. The extent of her injuries was not revealed at the time by police. However, later on, it was revealed that she was hit on the head three times with a hammer and was stabbed in the chest and back. A broken bottle was found embedded in her chest. The following month, on 10th of July, 1977, Peter assaulted 43-year-old Maureen Long in Bradford. Maureen was leaving a nightclub when he offered her a lift home. Maureen stopped to urinate and that's when Peter struck her on the head, knocking her out. When she was found, Maureen was suffering from hypothermia and was in hospital for nine weeks. During the investigation, a witness misidentified the make of Peter's car, resulting in more than 300 police officers checking thousands of cars without success. On 1st of October 1977, Peter murdered 20-year-old Jean Bernadette Jordan, a prostitute from Manchester. Just after 9 p.m., Peter was cruising the area of Moss Side when he picked up Jean. After they arrived in Princess Road near the Southern Cemetery, he hit her once in the head, then hit her ten more times. In a later confession, Peter said he had realized that the new five-pound note he gave to Jean was traceable, so after hosting a family party at his new home, he went back to the wasteland behind Manchester's Southern Cemetery, where he left Jean's body, but he couldn't really get the five pound note back. On 9th of October, Jean's body was discovered by the local dairy worker and future actor Bruce Jones, who had an allotment on the land adjoining the site and was searching for house bricks when he made the discovery. Now, remember the five pound note? 
It was actually hidden in a secret compartment in Jean's handbag. That's why Peter couldn't find the note. He didn't know where to look for it. This note was traced to branches of the Midland Bank in Shipley and Bingley. Police analysis of bank operations allowed them to narrow their field of inquiry to 8,000 employees who could have received it in their wage packet. Over the following three months, police interviewed 5,000 men, including Peter Sutcliffe. The police found that the alibi given for Peter's whereabouts that he attended a family party was credible. Go figure! After weeks of intense investigations around the origins of the five-pound note, which led police to nothing really, investigators were frustrated that they had an important clue, but they were not able to trace the actual firm to which or to whom this note was issued. But you interviewed him already. Yeah. On 14th of December, Peter attacked Marilyn Moore, a 25-year-old prostitute, in the back of his car on waste ground in Scott, in Scott Hall, Leeds. On this occasion, Peter actually lost his balance when he hit Marilyn with a hammer, which thankfully resulted in Marilyn escaping, but with severe head injuries, however, alive. Tire tracks found at the scene matched the dose from an earlier attack. The resulting photo feed from this attack looked very similar to Peter, just the same as those from other survivors. Marilyn also provided a good description of Peter's car, which was seen in, the re in red light areas. Peter was, in fact, interviewed about this. The police stopped the search for the person who received the five-pound note in January 1978. Even though Peter was interviewed about the note, he wasn't investigated any further. He was contacted and disregarded by the Reaper squad on several further occasions. That same month, Peter killed Yvonne Ann Pearson, a 21-year-old prostitute from Bradford, on 21st of January 1978. He repeatedly bludgeoned her on the head with a ball pin hammer, then jumped on her chest before stuffing horse hair into her mouth from a discarded sofa under which he hid her body near Lamb Lane. Ten days later, which I might say is an escalation here, on 31st of January, Peter killed Elena Helen Ritka, an 18-year-old prostitute from Huddersfield, striking her on the head five times as she got out of his car before stripping most of the clothing from her body although her bra and polo neck jumper were positioned above her breasts. He also repeatedly stabbed her in the chest. Her body was found three days later beneath railway arches in Garrard's timber yard to where he had driven her. And just think about this, he was already interviewed by police before killing the two women in the same month. Later on, Peter said about Elena while in police custody in 1981, I had the urge to kill any woman. The urge inside me to kill girls was now practically uncontrollable. Vera Evelyn Millward, 40 years old, was a prostitute who left her home in Charlton on Medlock at 10 p.m. on 16th of May 1978, telling her boyfriend that she was going out to buy cigarettes. Peter picked her up and after she got out of his car, he attacked her with a hammer. After she died, he dragged her body against a fence and began to stab her repeatedly with a knife. On 4th of April 1979, Peter killed Josephine Ann Whitaker, a 19-year-old clerk. He attacked her on Saville Park Moor in Halifax, West Yorkshire, as she was walking home. He hit her from behind with his hammer and hit her again as she lay on the ground. He then proceeded to stab her 21 times with a screwdriver in the chest and stomach and six times in the right leg before thrusting the screwdriver into her private area. 
Josephine's skull was fractured from ear to ear. Now, I'm wondering, is it possible that there were even more victims in between that we don't actually know of? Because it seems to me that Peter would attack mostly more than once a month and then he would have a cool-off period of a few months before killing again, which, you know, it's a bit odd. If he had this uncontrollable urge, could he have waited months before the next victim? In a way, it doesn't really make sense. Even though police had forensic evidence, they got distracted for several months. Police received a taped message claiming to be from the murderer taunting Assistant Chief Constable George Oldfield of the West Yorkshire Police who was leading the investigation. The tape had a man's voice saying, I'm Jack, I see you are having no luck catching me. I have the greatest respect for you, George, but Lord, you're no nearer catching me now than four years ago when I started. So, based on this recorded message, police started searching for a man with a wearside accent, which linguists narrowed down to the Castletown area of Sunderland, Tyne and Ware. The man, nicknamed Wareside Jack, sent two letters to police and the Daily Mirror in March 1978 boasting of his crimes. The letters, signed Jack the Ripper, claimed responsibility for the murder of 26-year-old Joanne Harrison in Preston in November 1975. There were multiple billboards placed across Northern England in 1979 appealing for information leading to the identity of Wareside Jack. I'm Jack. I see you are still having no look catching me. I have the greatest respect for you, George. Good Lord. You are no near catching me now than four years ago when I started. I reckon your boys are letting you down, George. They can't be much good, can they? The only time they came near catching me was a few months back in Chapel Town, when I was disturbed. I warned you in March that I'd strike again. Sorry it wasn't bad, but I'm not quite sure when I'll strike again. But it will be definitely sometime this year. I'm not sure where. Maybe Manchester. I like it there. There's plenty of them knocking about. They never learn, do they, George? I bet you've warned them, but they never listen. Well, it's been nice chatting to you, George. Yours, Chuck the Ripper. But it turns out that these were fake. It was all a hoax. It was a hoax. The case of the letters was reopened in 2005 and DNA taken from envelope was entered into the national database. The DNA matched John Samuel Humble, an unemployed alcoholic and a longtime resident of the Ford estate in Sunderland, a few miles from Castletown. His DNA had been taken after a drunk and disorderly offense in 2001. On 20th of October 2005, John was charged with attempting to pervert the course of justice for sending the hoax letters and the tapes. He was remanded in custody and on 21st of March 2006 he was convicted and sentenced to eight years in prison. He died in uh, on 30th of July 2019, aged 63. Is it possible that maybe, maybe Peter somehow convinced this guy to send the letters and the tape trying to divert the investigation in a different direction away from him? I really don't know. What do you guys think? In, on 1st of September 1979, Peter murdered 20-year-old Barbara Janine Babs Leach, a Bradford University student. Her body was dumped at the rear of 13 Ash Grove under a pile of bricks close to the university and her lodgings. This was the murder of another woman who wasn't a prostitute. It panicked the public and prompted a publicity campaign emphasizing the Wareside connection. Despite the false lead, Peter Sutcliffe was interviewed on at least two other occasions in 1979. 
with several matching forensic clues and on the list of 300 names in connection with the five pound note, Peter wasn't really suspected. In April 1980, Peter was arrested for drunk driving. While he was awaiting trial, he killed 47-year-old civil servant Marguerite Walls on the night of 20th of August 1980. 1980. Marguerite left her office between 9.30 p.m. and 10.30 p.m. to walk to her home in Farsley. Peter incapacitated her with a hammer blow to the back of the head as he continued to strike her while yelling filthy prostitute beside a driveway. He needed to move her 20 yards from the place of the attack up the driveway and into a high-walled garden so he first tied a length of rope around her neck and tightened it. He choked her kneeling on her chest and removed every piece of clothing for, from her while she was dead, leaving just her tights. He covered her body partially with grass and leaves before he left. On 24th of September 1980, a 34-year-old doctor from Singapore, Upadhyaya Bandara, was walking home from meeting friends when Peter followed her into an alley in Hiddingly, Leeds. He struck her on the head, rendering her unconscious, then dragged her along the street with a rope around her neck and fled the scene after he was scared by someone. On 25th of October, 21-year-old Maureen Mo Lee, an art student at Leeds University, was attacked by Peter. She was in a pub with her friends in the Chapel Town neighborhood of the city when she was attacked as she hurried down a dark street to catch the bus home. Maureen suffered significant wounds when she woke up in the hospital, including a puncture hole to the back of her skull, a fractured skull, a fractured cheekbone, a broken jaw, a severed spinal cord and numerous scratches and bruises. 16-year-old Teresa Sykes was attacked in Huddersfield on the night of 5th of November 1980. Teresa was going to a shop in Oaks, Huddersfield when Peter hit her from behind. Teresa started screaming and luckily her boyfriend heard her screams and ran out scaring Peter off. Teresa was recovering from brain surgery when Peter was arrested. And uh, with this we got to the end of part one. In the next part we will be talking about how Peter got caught, uh, the trial and everything else that followed. So basically the rest. And it's going to be about the same length as this video was. So, you know, keep an eye out for part two of this. And uh, I think uh, I will post this in around two or three days time. So in around two or three days time. So, you know, just have a bit of patience. I have no idea what costume is this. I just found it in one of the bags in my shed and I don't know. But anyway, thank you guys so much for staying with me. Take care, stay safe and I will see you in the next one. Bye.